Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for showing up today. So um, this is our very first webinar. So bear with us. Um, we are normal people and these are our very favorite topics. So Tylee Fuller and I are going to be um, trying our best to not stay on here for hours and hours and hours because we can talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. Um, it's in both of our blood to help people with this. So first of all, I wanna talk about what is inflammation. So I know that our listeners really don't have a clue as to what all diseases and problems involve inflammation. Um, most people, when they think of inflammation, they think of, you know, like you're inflamed, um, an inflamed joint. Um, and it goes more than that. So I'm just gonna kind of go over what some of that is. So the word inflammation, it actually traces back to the Latin word that means set on fire. I thought that was really cool. And as I was learning and researching, you know, about inflammation and going through that, I think, you know, I deal with rheumatoid arthritis and I feel like I'm on fire a lot of times. So, so do all of my clients that have an um, inflammation of the body. Some conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, you will actually feel heat and pain, redness and swelling. But in other cases like heart disease, Alzheimer's, and also diabetes, it's not so obvious. So, you know, that, that really just breaks it down to, to me. And you start thinking, you're like, how many diseases does, does inflammation have something to do with? Um, and how living an, an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, how is that gonna be able to affect you positively? So um, first of all, heart disease. I'm just gonna name some of these, go over a few. These are main ones that I actually see clients for. Heart disease is inflamed arteries. Um, it's common um, to have inflamed arteries if you have heart disease. So some re researchers think that when fat builds up, in the walls of the heart, the body fires back with an inflammatory response since it sees this as an injury. Inflammation is because of that. Um, it, it thinks your body thinks that something is an injury, so it's trying to help to heal you. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting because that is not something that you hear a lot when you talk about inflammation is heart disease. Um, type two diabetes is another one. That inflammation, it's type two, um, doctors don't know yet what the cause is of diabetes type 2, but experts say obesity triggers the inflammation, which makes it higher, harder for the body to use your insulin. And that makes a lot of sense as well. And um, when someone is overweight and, and or don't, don't eat well or don't exercise, and it causes more inflammation in the body, of course, other organs and, and you're just, your whole body is going to be affected by that. And type two diabetes can be controlled 100% by diet and exercise. So that is a topic for another webinar, but I did want to throw that out there. And um, they also believe dementia could actually be caused um, by inflammation of the brain. Um, and that, that's, that's pretty interesting as well. You know, and if you think about it, if something is inflamed and you're, you're dealing with issues on that, and um, you know, you're, you're constantly having inflammation in the brain, I can see how it would cause dementia. It would cause issues with the way that our brains work. So um, that chronic inflammation, you hear a lot of people say that they deal with inflammation every day of their life. Some people don't have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or fibromyalgia, but they have chronic pain every day, all day, whether it's their back or their, you know, the backs of their legs or their knees or, their, you know, and everybody that I've talked to in my whole life have had that happen at one point or another. Inflammation is not a horrible thing whenever it's a short-term thing. So, you know, if you're injured and your body becomes inflamed because you've fallen and hurt your knee, that is one thing. It's, it's using that inflammation to heal you. If it is something that is long-term over time, it's going to cause damage. And um, it's gonna cause damage everywhere, wherever you hurt, wherever your inflammation is, it's gonna cause damage there. And, and eventually it does cause major, major health problems. As you can tell, heart disease, dementia, and then you start talking about type two diabetes. 
Um, another thing, you know, RA, fibromyalgia, lupus, those are all inflammatory diseases. So um, I personally deal with rheumatoid arthritis. I also have celiac disease. Both of those are inflammatory diseases. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, it just came, I've always had problems with pain. I never ate well. I was never active growing up. I was overweight when I became a young adult and um, 304 pounds with no exercise. And um, once I lost the weight, I felt better. And then about a month into my career of being a personal trainer, I woke up one morning and I could not walk. No warning, nothing. I just woke up, could not walk. And I luckily had had like yearly lab work the week before. I called the um, doctor's office and they just simply said, you have rheumatoid arthritis, we're gonna call you in some medicine. And I was, I, I actually had been training people with rheumatoid arthritis, so I wasn't okay with that answer. But um, I did have a pity party for about a month. And um, because I'm not going to lie, we're all entitled to that when we hurt every single day. And um, it's, it's, and, and sometimes um, we have to use our mind to get through it. But um, I had that pity party and I thought my career's over. I can't train anymore. And then I thought, no. The Lord gave this to you so that you can use this to help other people. And I began to study everything I could on being able to heal my own body and so that I can help others. And whenever um, I decided to do that, I started and um, I actually started doing um, light cardio and Pilates. And then I changed the way I ate. I went to eating all good whole foods um, which Tylee will talk about nutrition here in a minute, but um, those combined have kept me from being crippled. And um, 100%, without a doubt in my mind, that being on a good, healthy workout routine. So I cannot do the heavy, heavy, he hardcore, heavy duty workouts because it does send me into a flare. My body does not like that. I can do like one workout like that, maybe a month. But if I do it several times a week, like most people, it will send me in a flare. So the only way to keep me personally from, from going into those flares, like when the weather changes, when I'm stressed out, is I have to walk on the treadmill or outside for at least 10 to 20 minutes a day. I didn't say run, I meant walk, like just a walk getting the fluids moving, getting the lymphatic system working good, getting the brain, you know, to get that brain fog out of there. And um, then I use Pilates as well. I do Pilates and if I can do Pilates every single day, I try to get that done. I definitely do it at least three days a week. And if I do those combined, I do not have to take um, any kind of medication. I do take, um, I used to take 800 milligrams of ibuprofen a day. And um, then I would take, on top of that, I would take Excedrin because of the, the, I have RA in every joint. So I would get really bad headaches in the back of my head when I would start to flare. I no longer have to take that. So um, that that's super exciting because, you know, that's something that I did, I was proactive about and I take vitamins. There's different vitamins you can take for that. Um, that help you and you know your doctor can help you with getting a good regimen of vitamins together that help to keep the inflammation down. So that is my, my story. And I, like I said, I, I'm not on any medications. I do still have bad days, but I would say 99% of my days are not filled with pain from RA. And it, it I just, I, it's crazy because you actually can take control over it with just a little bit of movement and a little bit of thought every day. And it can help you tremendously be able to go to work, to be able to play with your kids, to be able to get out of bed in the morning. I know how those days are. I've been there, I've been there. And until I figured out that right formula for me, it just, it, you know, I had some bad days. And, and even my clients can tell you that there may be one or two really bad, bad days in the year that I will have to take off work because I don't hurt or because I hurt and just can't, can't function that day. But that, hey, I'll take that. It's better than living every day confined because um, 
you have the power to, to change that. And I think it's very important that people understand that you, if you will learn what works for you and be patient, you're going to feel better. So that, that's, and, and I could talk about that forever as well, but I just kind of want to tell you a little bit about Pilates. So I, it took me a bit, I had to write this down because there's a lot of information about Pilates that I'd love to share. Um, I just got done reading a book. It's called The Caged Lion. It is on Joseph Pilates. He is the creator of Pilates and he is amazing, amazing. He was an amazing man, he was very smart. <laughs> he created it um, during World War I and he created it around a hospital bed so that bedridden soldiers could use it as a therapeutic exercise and be able to do it. And um, he, he used it also to work on their mind, which is important, especially for us that deal with inflammation. And um, he, you use that and it helps the mind so that you're not, not having what I call my pity parties, it helps you. So um, Pilates is a whole body, mind body workout. It is um, the best core ab strengthening exercise you could do. So there's that. So those that think that it's just easy, it's not. Um, it is using your core the whole entire time. So um, to make every move, which actually strengthens that core around the spine, keeps the spine um, protected. And also like I do have RA all the way down my spine as well. So um, it does keep that pain level down or non-existent. So um, let's, let's go into, it creates lean, long muscle. And what is so exciting about that is lean, long muscle is important for our joints, for our muscles, our tendons, for our connective tissue, for everything inside our body. It is important to have that lean, long muscle. The bulky muscle that people have isn't bad, but our main important thing is going to be that lean, long muscle to keep you from having health issues and having damage from inflammation. It is so, so important. So it is a saving grace when it comes to inflammation. And I can't say this enough. I just think everybody should give Pilates a chance, do 30 sessions. And if you don't like it and you don't feel better, then, then you, you're only out, because it's usually 30, 45 minute sessions, you're only out that time. And it's worth it. And I believe that it will change your life. That is a big, big thing to me. And um, it is, I have a lot of questions. A lot of people say, is it yoga? No, it's not yoga. It is a, okay, the difference is yoga is more of a static hold um, there's different forms of yoga. There's, you know, different ways to do yoga. Not that yoga is bad, but Pilates is an actual flow. It's a flow of movements. There's some similar um, movements in it, but with Pilates, it's a flow of movement. You're using your body to work all together, mind, body, and soul. All of it works together to create that healthy, lean body. And um, it's kind of funny because in that book, I found it funny that every time I ask a client, you know, what, what do you like most about Pilates? And they're like, I don't know, I just like it. Or it makes me, it, it feels good. I feel good when I stretch. And in the book, it said that every client that Joseph Pilates had could not explain why they liked Pilates. And that was pretty much what they all would say. They would say, it, it makes me feel good. Oh, well that, you know, I don't know. I just do it because that's what I need to do. And it feels good. And, and I agree with that. Like there is nothing better going into a class or into a session of Pilates with someone that's being in pain and get done with the session and they feel amazing and they jump up and they go about their day. You know, it's, it's just an amazing, I call Pilates magic. And, and I, I will always say that. And it is my saving grace as well. Um, Pilates also provides proper breathing, core work, along with supported movement. So we, we focus a lot on our breathing. Breathing is important for our stress levels, for, um, for all of your, your living body. 
uh, we need to breathe correctly. So in every Pilates class that I teach, I cue them, breathe in and breathe out when they need to, to get the most from each move. Um, and then also to relax the body and to get the mind with the body and not thinking about what's going on in the world. And um, that's, that's awesome too, a, a part of it. When it comes to fight inflammation, one of the ways that Pilates does so is by improving the efficiency, I can't ever say that word, efficacy of your body's lymphatic system. So that should explain to a lot of my clients that have been coming to Pilates, how that is. Like, it seems like after you get done with Pilates, you're really thirsty or you have to go to the bathroom. And when your lymphatic system starts working because you are doing those flowing movements, it's going to get rid of all the toxins. That's one of the things. In the book that I read was Joseph Pilates believed that everyone should take a hard bristled brush and scrub their body in the shower after Pilates to get rid of the toxins that are coming out with the lymphatic system. So um, I think that's pretty interesting to me. I do not have my clients do that. I don't know that it would make it work any better, but he knew what he was talking about. So who's to second guess him on that? Um, it, it's just a gentle way to stimulate the lymphatic system. We have recently started adding in what I call the pain clinic into our classes. Um, we use a foam roller and we use a tennis ball. It's basically like a hands-off body work and it will, um, that has also helped me. It's helped a lot of people with pain. I have one client that has, has had actually had a rotator cuff surgery about 10 years ago and she has always hurt since then. But now that we've rolled out pressure points, not on the direct area, and it has completely relieved and made all of her pain go away. So she, you know, she's been in pain for 10 years in that arm and just learning simple techniques to get the uh, connective tissue rehydrated and working well is important. And a lot of, and then we also use a tennis ball. We use that on our pressure points too. And it will get, it's helped get, get rid of a, a headache for me. I get migraines every now and then it's helped with that. It is um, awesome in the fact that I have learned a lot in the last probably year, I should say, that your pressure points on your body, because we have pressure points in our hands, we have pressure points on our feet, we have them all over. And just because your low back hurts doesn't always mean it's your low back that needs help. And, and people don't understand that because, you know, we always think, oh, my shoulder hurts. Let's rub it right here where it hurts. And it's usually, that's not going to do anything. So, you know, learning the right proper techniques for that. And it's the same thing with Pilates, you know, learning what your body actually needs is super important for keeping the inflammation down, getting rid of those toxins and to, to you know, all of that is going to help you with stress. Stress keeps the inflammation levels down. It's just an amazing way to add into your already healthcare team is adding in practicing Pilates, learning some self and um, foam rolling and tennis ball uh, pressure point rolling and, and learning that technique is super important. I, um, I could talk about that as well forever, but um, that is all I have to say right now. So I am going to hand it over to Miss Tylee. All right, thanks for talking about Pilates. I will say that I was never consistent with my exercise until I discovered Pilates. And that is because it just makes you feel better. And so you wanna keep doing it. So um, that, that was awesome. Let me do a screen share. So this is my first time to make a presentation for Warrior Wellness. So I added some fighters here. Let me know if you can see them. Okay, so when Paula says to be a warrior for your health, she's not kidding. 
if you had somebody or something that was trying to hurt you or kill you, you would probably fight back, right? You wouldn't let them get to you. So there are things that we are putting into our body that is aggravating the body. So I'm going to show this next screen and I want you to take a look at this and notice how everything is connected and not just with inflammation, but other diseases as well. Do you see some things for the stomach, for the heart, um, even high blood sugar? So some of the causes of inflammation are you are allergic to something insulin resistance, old injuries, too much iron, too much omega-6 over omega-3 in your diet, also liver damage, a congested gallbladder that's inflamed, or a high cortisol level. And I wanted to make a note here that a sign that your cause might be the gallbladder or high cholesterol is if you wake up with a flat stomach but you have bloating in the evening. Okay, so let's talk about these foods that are aggravating the body. These are the top four foods that cause inflammation. We have gluten canola, soybean, and vegetable oil, because that's high in omega-6 oil. Also, white sugar, which is why I spend so much of my time making desserts, but healthier. And I still make desserts for my family, but they have honey, like my cookies, or Paula's Energy Bites, or Swerve, like my cupcakes, or coconut sugar, like my chocolate muffins. That way, there's, there's ways to I'm not taking any sweet thing out of my life. I'm just doing it in a different way. And then the fourth one is that for some people, it's dairy that can cause inflammation. And let's just sum this list up. We have to eat better to feel better. So it's not that you cannot ever have sugar or oil with omega-6 fatty acids, but you want to avoid these most days. I'm gonna pick on donuts for an example. So something like a donut is processed sugar and gluten that has been fried in vegetable oil. So it's just bad on top of bad in layers. All right, so what kind of diet should you follow? There's so many of them out there. The best example of a diet that combats inflammation is the Mediterranean diet. Um, look at the bottom. Notice that it mentions daily physical activity. That's part of it. And then of course, you also have um, just kind of a different viewpoint than your typical food pyramid, which is that you have vegetables, fruits, and then also beans and nuts in the same category, like the same amounts. And then you also have your olive oil, which by the way, you can also use avocado oil to get omega-3 oils in. And then of course, these are the things you eat every day. They also have a category for weekly. So things like fish, poultry, eggs, and even sweet treats weekly. And then of course, monthly, that's where you have your red meat. Um, and of course, other kinds of sweets that you would not normally have. All right. What can you eat? What are foods that reduce inflammation and pain? I kind of put it into four groups here, four main groups. And then I also want to talk about some spices that can help, like ginger and turmeric. So 
let's go over, I think everybody understands fruits and veggies pretty well. Make sure that you're not preparing your veggies in an oil. You wanna saute them in broth or steam them. And then also on the grains, we have alternatives to wheat like rice, oats, corn, and quinoa. Now, take it easy on the corn. That's just a little bit. Like you don't want too much. Corn does have omega-6 fatty acid in it. So again, that is something you should use sparingly, but you can still have some of it. The main thing is that we do want to focus on omega-3 fatty acid. So what does that look like for someone that has inflammation right now? I would suggest a good snack would be raw walnuts. You don't want them to be cooked because they're going to destroy that precious omega-3. You want um, raw walnuts, and you can also add chia seeds and flax seeds ground up into your oatmeal. I've also, let me stop my screen share. All right. And also, I just wanted to mention that I've posted a video on our group page on the Band app that includes a video about anti-inflammatory smoothies that you can make and also using the roots of ginger and turmeric and what I thought was an easy way, which is why I shared the video, because it can get confusing on how to use that stuff. But I actually... Um, I really thought it was a, a pretty good video on how to start using these anti-inflammatory spices in your smoothies and you can make a tea with them as well. All right, thanks Paula. So Tylee, let me ask you, I have some questions and um, that I know that other people are probably gonna have questions as well. First, I wanna ask, um, for me personally, I know that I can eat a little differently when it comes to infl inflammatory foods than say one other client I have or another client that's got inflammation. So for me, I am still able to eat tomatoes. They say tomatoes are high in inflammation, I hear. And I, I am able to do that, but I cannot do dairy. But I have another client that is able to do dairy and it's fine, like in moderation, I can't do it. If I do it once a month, I'm paying for it. So is that common that everybody is a little different on that? Yeah, everybody is different. And the reason for your inflammation is gonna be different as well. Let me ask you this, is your problem with cooked tomatoes or uncooked tomatoes? No, I don't have any, like I can eat all, all different types. I have, um, I do have one client that she was not able to, she's not able to do ketchup stewed tomatoes or raw tomatoes. There's something in there, but it, oh, it okay. always makes, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And I just found that that it's kind of interesting because I know that there's so many people out there that are like, you mean I can't eat, I can't eat this, I can't eat that. And especially if you Google anti-inflammatory foods, you know, or what can I have? And it's, it's scary because it's like, okay, I can have nothing. Well. You know, it's finding out that, and I think you will agree, that finding out what works for you and what doesn't. So, because everybody's different. So I have, I always do a process of elimination. So if I know I, I, I felt bad after I ate dairy for several weeks or whatever, that's how I figured it out. I was like, okay, I was doing whey protein shakes. So I stopped doing them and I felt better. Well, then I drank one more after two weeks and immediately I started to feel bad again. So I knew then that that's what it was. So if you wanna find out what it could be for you, then the first thing you're gonna do is for two weeks, you're going to eliminate dairy, gluten, and corn, and tomatoes. You're gonna to eliminate a lot of things. And after the two weeks is over, you're gonna add one back in and see how you feel. And that's the elimination diet. Yes. Yes, that's, that's what I was wondering. So we do have some guests on, and if you want to um, unmute and ask any questions, you may do so at this time. No takers? Question. Hello, can you hear me? We can. 
I was wondering, um, I do have family members that do have lupus, that have um, Sjogren's and uh, RA. We know gluten-free are things we need to stay away from. Um, we have substitute butter for like avocado. We just crush avocados and that's what we use as a butter. And uh, uh, pasta, everything, bread has been changed into gluten-free. Is that something that we should keep doing or do you have something else that you recommend we need to switch to? I think those are some good changes. I think they're great changes as well. I think, you know, Jenna, uh, D, I know that um, the question you're asking about, and basically if, if that family member, if your family member is still feeling bad after eliminating those things, then it might be time to see if maybe it's the corn or the tomatoes, if, you know, products. And um, something that I can tell you is that being that I have celiac disease, I have, gluten can stay in your system. And that's a whole nother webinar. Gluten can stay in your system for up to six months. Wow. So um, yes, so once you stop doing it, you're gonna feel somewhat better. You're gonna know pretty, pretty quick. But if in, even if I slip and I get it when I go out to eat, it can still affect me a month later. So, you know, it's and gluten, it just depends on how sensitive someone is to that and how That's much inflammation. Mm -hmm. So, okay. but I, I think, and Tyler, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I really think that like the next step would be if you're not feeling a lot better, you're feeling somewhat better, but you're not feeling a lot better, then take out another food that's high in the inflammation category, which would be like, like, like Tylee said, like tomatoes, corn. Um, and, and I have seen quite a, a, a bit of people that have to take corn out. And I, yes. I don't. Cause we got a re we got a list of things to eliminate and I'm not kidding. That list is rather depressing because it almost feels like, well, the only thing left to eat is grass. And it's like, uh -huh. well, we're not cows. We need, you know what I mean? It's like, while we really do want to stay on track and make sure we are eating well, it's almost like everything is restricted. No onions, no garlic, no pepper, no black pepper, no tomatoes, no. I mean, it's a list of no's, but we were not given a list of yeses. And now we are having to do our own research and go through to see what to eat, what not to eat, what to eliminate. But like you ladies just said, people's systems are also different. And it's like going through and throwing things away and then re-adding back. But it's like, how much of that, how, how long does the whole process take before we get to a comfortable place where we're like, okay, these are the no's and these are the yeses. Don't forget keeping a food journal and what you're eating, keeping oh. track of that would help too. And also write down how you're feeling that day. Okay. I think, um, yeah, I, and I also, I know that the audience is curious, you know, like, where do I find a good list or where do I get help for that? Kylie is amazing at what she does. She does have a bachelor's in nutrition and she actually specializes in the anti-inflammatory diet. So she will, um, would be glad to make an appointment and do um, a one-time session with you on her nutrition. So you can always um, just go to our website and ask for information and then we can get it that way. Did anybody else have any questions? Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. I do. Um, does couscous fall underneath the same grains category as uh, quinoa? Does what fall into the same category as quinoa? Couscous. Oh, that's wheat. Okay. So that's not the same. Well, I wasn't sure that's why I asked. I've never even heard of couscous. So. Well, I would show you a picture, but you know. <laughs> hmm. 
That's a good question though, because, and, and, you know, it took me a long time to figure out what was gluten and what wasn't. And um, when some of these odd names, I'm like, oh, well, that's not wheat. So it's got to be good for me. And it's usually like in the same category. So it took me a while to learn it. It really did. Well, I guess if I would have actually finished reading the label underneath it, it says quality Durham wheat, a Moroccan style pasta. Yes. So. Um, and, and also like it, something to remember is that by law, if a food is gluten-free, there is a little baby round circle that will say gluten-free on, right. on the pa package. It, or it will say gluten-free in bold letters. That is by law. Now, when I became gluten-free at the beginning, they weren't, oh, none of that. I had to learn every weird word that I could not pronounce, so. Um, and just, just, I'm glad you brought that up. Gluten also, just so that people do know, because a lot of people are like, what is gluten? Gluten is a man-made substance that is wheat, rye, barley, and oats. And it is made, it was made to make it, things last longer on the shelf. It's a preservative. So, you know, some people can do one of those things without the others, if you have food allergies, but, Gluten is not good for anyone. And it's and that's something that you can actually look up to see what, what are some of the side effects of eating gluten. Because if you put that in Google, it will tell you, you know, migraines, ADHD, ADD, and I believe that. I believe it. And depression. I've seen I've seen clients that get off of gluten and their depression goes away. So that's pretty cool too. Are you done with your questions, Zoe? I have one more because it may sound like really weird or strange. Oh, wait, that's just me. Uh, it's been, oh, it's probably been a year or so ago when I bought some turmeric powder to cook with. And my husband has two different types of RA. And I, I had read and seen where it is helps with the inflammation. Well, for him, when I used it, he he actually felt more inflamed when I used it. Is that possible that it doesn't help? Like it would help me, but not help him? Well, I, I'm, from my experience, tumor, it makes me really sick. And I don't know, um, I've tried it all different ways, but it may just be that maybe I over consumed it and maybe he needs to ease into it too. Would you say maybe Tylee? If maybe that it just was too much and it's his body kind of just freaked out maybe on it but I, I hadn't heard of it not I had never heard of it increasing pain before because usually it's the opposite yeah it makes me extremely sick I, mean, I, I tried think, it I don't think he had to I mean I know he had some pain with it but this is also before we kind of got it under it was pre actual diagnosis or right after the diagnosis so he was still adjusting and he would swell more with it. So I just quit using it, but I've been starting to incorporate back into mine since it doesn't affect him anymore. Yeah, that's, so um, Tylee, do you have some, some ideas and, and thoughts for the listeners on ways to use turmeric? Well, I mean, you can get the root yourself and um, kind of peel it, cut it up and put it in smoothies or even make a tea with it. But if you don't like to do that, another option is to try the supplement and make sure that you get one that also has that added black pepper because that helps you absorb it. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. And, and that was something that I was going to ask actually after we got done. So I'm glad we asked that. Okay. Is that all of the questions or do we have some more? All right. I guess Miss M is good. I'm not hearing her. All right. So I hope we, we helped you guys in some way today. And I think the biggest thing that I want everyone to take from this video is you have to be proactive in your health. You are not supposed to live a pain, 
full life. And you can, I'm not saying that you can cure, we can cure you or you can cure yourself, but I'm telling you, we can make you feel a whole lot better. You have the power to do that. So, you know, take, take this information, reach out to us with questions because we are always here to help you. And like I said, this is Tylee and I, this is our favorite subjects. And um, we both um, have, you know, we both have many personal stories that go along with this that, that you know, of, of clients and family members and ourselves, what we've dealt with. And you don't have to live in pain every day. You don't. And the inflammation you're feeling, like I said, just because your back is hurting doesn't mean the inflammation is so much in the back. And um, it might be other places that we need to work on to get that pain level down. And then also, you know, like Tylee said, keeping a food log of what you're eating and how you feel right after that next day, the days after that, you know, keep watching that. And I promise you, you're going to see there's going to be a, um, a cycle with that. And, um, you know, if you're eating a lot of wheat, because most people eat a lot of wheat, they do because wheat is heart healthy to some people, but um, certain types of heat, wheat, and we could get into that, that too and take forever. But, you know, we do need healthy grains for our heart. So don't go completely, you know, on one diet because it, you've heard it does good for this or that. Um, I will tell you, I did the keto diet and oh my gosh, I shouldn't even brought this up. Um, oh, I, did the I did the keto diet for like two weeks, but um, because I had clients that were on it and if a doctor puts a patient on the keto diet, it is a medical diet. If they are being monitored, I, I don't have a problem with it. But when you're using it for weight loss, um, I actually have had a friend that um, put her daughter on keto and her daughter died because your body is depleted of potassium and, or it can be. So you have to be monitored by a doctor. A doctor has to help you with that so that they can make sure you're not um, deficient. But I did the keto diet because I also heard it was good for RA. And I thought, well, I'll try it for two weeks. And the first couple of days, man, I had so much energy and I was like, maybe I do feel good. And after that, I just crashed. And then I just did not feel good. And it took me forever to get my, because I get a lot of inflammation in my stomach since I have celiac disease and my stomach did not like it. My body did not like it. So, you know, and, and everybody's different, but we won't go into keto too much because I know Tylee and I will probably do a webinar on some of, the, on, on some of these diets, but look at her bite her lip. Keto does not make your stomach happy. It does not make your heart happy. No, that's not. You no. might lose weight at the beginning because you've taken out bread and sugar. But if you continue with that way of eating five years down the road, you're going to have a very unhappy stomach and heart. Yeah. And, you know, and, I, and I've had doctors that I've worked with that did put their clients or their patients on a keto diet for two weeks to kind of give their body a reset. And then they started adding in foods one at a time, kind of doing an elimination diet, but they started it out with keto. And that's better than saying, you know, stay on keto forever. But, and I have friends and, and clients that have been on keto for a long time, but I can promise you this, uh, diets don't work. The only thing that's gonna make you healthy and make you feel good is if you learn to eat a whole nutritional diet that is healthy and good for your body. And that's the bottom line. And like she said, the Mediterranean diet, I don't even know a whole lot about the Mediterranean diet, but I basically eat a lot of wool, how she had on there. Um, but it is a, it's, that's a pretty cool chart. So I will um, actually probably have Tylee send me her PowerPoint that she had in this, and I will attach it to the video and in the, or the YouTube video so that people can be able to see that PowerPoint. And it's very helpful information. So I appreciate everybody showing up today. Tylee, thank you so much for being my partner today and talking about our passion. And I pray that we helped somebody out there to, to, to finally understand that they are worth living a painless life. So thank you so much.
Absolutely. Thank you.